Alors, euh, bien, allons-y. Euh, bonjour à tous et à toutes. Euh, J'ai le plaisir d'annoncer le début de ce webinaire et je préciserai d'emblée qu'un service de traduction simultanée en anglais et en français est disponible. Et euh, si vous souhaitez euh, activer ce service, vous pouvez le faire en cliquant sur euh, l'icône de la petite planète qui est située en bas de votre euh, écran. Donc, hello everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure to uh, welcome you to this webinar. Uh, simultaneous French and English translation is provided. If you want to uh, activate the service, you may click on the planet icon, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there was, there's also ASL and LSQ uh, services provided, as you, uh, you can see on the screen. Alors, à partir de ce moment-ci, je vais continuer en français. Uh, nous avons également un service de traduction ASL et LSQ, comme vous pouvez le voir à l'écran. Donc, euh, vous remarquerez que cet événement est déjà en cours d'enregistrement. C'est pour le rendre accessible via notre site euh, par la suite pour que les gens le, le, puissent l'écouter le, 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 en différé. Donc, une fois que ces, ces petits détails sont maintenant précisés, je vous souhaite la, vraiment la bienvenue au nom du CRIMIS, euh, avec le soutien là, de, du Bureau euh, du Défenseur fédéral du logement de la Commission canadienne des droits de la personne. C'est un événement qu'on a fait conjointement. Donc, quelques mots sur le CRIMIS où je travaille. Donc, le CRIMIS, c'est le Centre de recherche de Montréal sur les inégalités sociales, les discriminations et les pratiques alternatives de citoyenneté. Nous sommes situés au sein d'un milieu, milieu de soins et de services sociaux, plus spécifiquement au Centre intégré universitaire de santé et de services sociaux. Et euh, on a une programmation de recherche qui, euh, qui s'intéresse aux questions d'inégalité sociale, un champ très actif dans le domaine de l'itinérance, avec plusieurs chercheurs, dont Swan McDonald, qui va parler dans un instant. Donc, dernier détail technique avant de donner la parole à Swan. Pour les personnes qui souhaitent poser des questions, partager des commentaires, l'utilisation du question-répondre est, est disponible tout au long de l'événement. Euh, et l'équipe de recherche va pouvoir y répondre ou gérer, euh, prendre connaissance en fait de vos, de vos commentaires ou questions et pourra y répondre au moment jugé opportun. Alors, euh, sans plus tarder, je vous souhaite un bon séminaire, un bon webinaire et je laisse la parole à Swan McDonald. Bonjour et bienvenue à notre webinaire. Est-ce que l'équipe peut me dire si vous voyez bien mon écran. On ne euh... voit pas le partage d'écran, Swan. Oh, C'est vraiment bizarre. Désolée, un petit instant, je vais juste rectifier ça. Attendez. Pourquoi ça ne fonctionne pas? Mais ça va fonctionner. D'accord. Je vais essayer. Vous voyez, mais vous, vous voyez, mais vous voyez avec mes notes, c'est ça? Oui, c'est bien ça. Quoi, c'est comme ça? Je suis désolée. Um, Laisse-moi juste faire une dernière manœuvre. Normalement, ça fonctionne. Normalement, je mets en PDF, donc je suis un peu mêlée. Use mode présent. The third button is not left. Ah oui, merci. Merci. OK, ben, attendez. Il faut juste que je fasse partage d'écran encore. Euh, ça. Et un peu encore. Vous le voyez, mais vous voyez avec mes notes, c'est ça? Oui, on voit encore avec mes notes. Je suis désolée. Je <rire> n'ai jamais arrivé comme ça. Je suis vraiment désolée. Euh, je vais commencer, puis ensuite, euh, je vais mettre... Euh, je, écoute, je vais commencer avec mon petit intro, puis ensuite, pendant que Marie-Josée Hull euh, prend la parole, je vais euh, rectifier ça. Je vais le mettre en PDF selon mon habitude. Donc, euh, bienvenue encore à notre webinaire. Euh, un survol des campements canadiens, une approche axée euh, sur le droit au logement. Euh, C'est un premier projet financé par le Bureau de la défenseur des logements situé à la Commission canadienne des droits de la personne. 
Ah, D'entrée de jeu, je souhaite reconnaître que je suis à Montréal, géojaguée et située en territoire autochtone non cédé et que la nation Ganyangaga est la gardienne des terres et des eaux, historiquement connue comme un lieu de rassemblement pour de nombreuses Premières Nations et premiers peuples. On behalf of the team today, we wish to acknowledge that the laws and policies in our report, uh, which will be available soon, are grounded in the colonial, legal, and political structures forcibly overlaid on the pre-existing Indigenous systems of law and governance of these places. These structures have been and continue to be instruments of dispossession, violence, and disconnection from territory, place, culture, community, and family. Housing precarity and homelessness are intertwined with this colonial reality and the overlap of federal, provincial, and municipal jurisdictions and the attempted erasure of, of indigenous jurisdiction is starkly evident in some of our findings. In our view, indigenous systems of law and governance must be central uh, to any meaningful attempt to address homelessness and realize the right to housing. And we just wanted to say that uh, from the outset. Uh, today's speakers, uh, we have the entire re research team here. Uh, J'ai vraiment le grand honneur de travailler avec des personnes exceptionnelles dans le cadre de ce projet qui sommes ici aujourd'hui. Uh, Alexandra Flynn of the University of British Columbia, Joe Hermer from the University of Toronto, Caroline Leblanc de l'Université de Sherbrooke, Caitlin Schwann from the Women's National Housing and Homelessness Network, Esther Van Wagner from New York University, Et nous sommes très honorés d'accueillir Madame Marie-José Hull, notre première défenseur fédérale du logement, and Kim Hines, founder of the Living Lived Experience of Homelessness Network. Thank you very much for being with us today. I'm trying to speak slowly. This is very difficult for me as I tend to talk very quickly. We also, uh, before I pass over um, the mic to, to Madame Hull, we also want to acknowledge the invaluable contributions of many people to this project, including Laurie Baco, Sidney Chapados, Sam Freeman, Pedram Golipou, Palmira Lutoto, Neil McIsaac, Isabelle Raffestin, Emily Roberge, and Emma Smith, as well as the many peer and people with lived experience and community organizations that contribute to this project. Sans plus attendre, je vais céder la parole à Madame Marie-Josée Hull pendant que j'installe à la diapo. Je suis vraiment désolée. Uh, Marie-Josée Hull, who is the federal housing advocate and is appointed to promote and protect the right to housing in Canada. Thank you for being with us today, Madame Hull. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. First of all, I, I want to say, um, whenever I hear Madame Hull, I'm like, that, that's my grandmother, right? Um, so anyone can feel welcome to call me Marie-Josée. And I grew up in Alberta, so MJ also works, or Marie. But, um, you know, having said that, I, I do want to say that it is my absolute pleasure to join you all today and provide some introductory remarks for this really important conversation about homeless encampments. C'est un plaisir d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Merci de m'avoir invité à contribuer à cette importante conversation sur les campements de personnes en situation d'itinérance. Mes remarques seront prononcées en anglais et en français, et je vous encourage donc à être prêt à utiliser les services de traduction simultanés prévus si nécessaire. My remarks will be delivered in both English and French, so I encourage you to be ready to use the simultaneous translation services provided as needed. J'aimerais tout d'abord reconnaître le privilège de m'adresser à vous depuis les terres ancestrales et non cédées de la nation algonquine Anishinaabe, connue sous le nom colonial d'Ottawa. Comme il s'agit d'un événement virtuel, je tiens également à reconnaître les territoires ancestraux des Premières Nations, des Inuits et des Métis de ce pays. Cette reconnaissance du territoire est un, est un engagement envers la relation que nous partageons et construisons avec les peuples autochtones, une relation basée sur l'amitié, la paix, le respect mutuel et la réconciliation. Et en prononçant ces mots, je suis aussi pleinement consciente de l'incapacité des gouvernements successifs et du peuple canadien à honorer les engagements passés et nous devons gagner la confiance des peuples autochtones par nos actions. La crise du logement et de l'itinérance au Canada, notamment le nombre disproportionné de personnes autochtones qui vivent dans les campements, nous rappelle l'impact de nos échecs et nous montre tout 
le chemin qu'il reste à parcourir afin de respecter nos obligations. I will now switch to English. Je vais continuer en anglais. I'm here today in my role as the federal housing advocate. But first and foremost, I'm here as a person who has experienced poverty, displacement, geographic marginalization, and housing precarity. I assumed my new role in February of this year, and my mandate is independent of government and nonpartisan. And I act as Canada's watchdog for the right to adequate housing and try to ensure that housing conversations focus on human rights. And I do this by amplifying the voices of, of people experiencing inadequate housing and homelessness and holding governments accountable and making recommendations to improve housing related laws, programs and policies. And it's important to recognize that the advocate is not a recourse mechanism for individual complaints. The act makes it clear that my role is to focus on systemic housing issues influencing legislation, policies, and programs. So these systemic issues are identified by submissions coming from organizations or the public through my engagement with Indigenous communities, people with lived experience, and as a result of research and studies. In the case of encampments, I adopted this issue as a priority in large part because of the research we'll be hearing about today. and and. I have since had the chance to meet with encampment residents in British Columbia, and we've started to receive submissions regarding encampments as a systemic housing issue. Encampments are one of the most visible signs of our current housing crisis and among the most egregious examples of failures of government to implement the right to adequate housing in Canada with permanent housing solutions. And they're not, they're not a new phenomenon in Canada, but the situation has been made worse by the pandemic and the current economic downturn. So economics have disproportionate levels of residents who are First Nation, Inuit, or Métis that lack social support to maintain housing in towns or cities, or often report having to flee violence or do not have adequate housing if they're from an Indigenous community. And too many people in Canada have little choice but to turn to living in tents or in formal shelters to survive. Too many people have been harmed and died as a result of exposure, fire, overdose, and other threats to life and safety. And residents also face harassment and violence from state and non-state actors. And while these conditions amount to serious violations of fundamental human rights, including the right to housing, they also need to be seen as human rights claims. And despite their existence in Canada for so many years, encampments receive little attention from authorities until recently. And sadly, when encampments make the news, it's mostly because encampment residents are facing forced evictions. So fortunately, there's more awareness and understanding today thanks to the fantastic efforts by lived experts and countless advocates across the country. And the research presented today adds to the recent Auditor General's report and a growing body of evidence to demonstrate that current approaches to homelessness, they are not working. The research we're about to hear about is an important contribution to changing the discourse, an important contribution to recognizing the human rights of encampment residents. And these research findings will guide my efforts as advocate uh, for approaches to encampments rooted in the principles of human rights. My office has been privileged to work with the Université de Montréal, who convened a research team that included lived expertise, scholars, advocates, and activists from communities across Canada. And many of these researchers are here with us today, and I want to take this opportunity to thank them for their incredible work highlighting the human rights dimension of encampments. Avant tout, les personnes qui vivent dans les campements et les personnes qui défendent leurs intérêts ont réclamé un nombre de convenables de logements sûrs, adéquats et sécuritaires. Un aspect crucial relatif aux droits de la personne dans les campements est la prestation des services essentiels. Les principales violations des droits fondamentaux relevées par le projet de recherche sont les mesures de maintien de l'ordre et de l'application de la loi visant les personnes vivant dans les campements. 
De nombreuses administrations municipales au Canada ont systématiquement choisi de distribuer les contraventions, de délivrer les avis d'expulsion et d'enlever ou de détruire les tentes et le matériel plutôt que de faire respecter les droits de, la, de ces personnes en matière de sûreté, de sécurité et de dignité humaine. Et la recherche a également montré que les personnes vivant dans les campements étaient soumises à des expulsions dangereuses et à des déplacements forcés. En fait, les expulsions des campements euh, compromettent souvent la sécurité puisque ces personnes se trouvent souvent dans des situations encore plus précaires et dangereuses par la suite. Pour réaliser le droit au logement, il est essentiel que les personnes en situation d'itinérance participent concrètement à la conception et à la mise en œuvre des politiques, des programmes et des pratiques. Selon la recherche, les personnes vivant dans les campements sont souvent perçues par les médias comme des non-citoyens ou comme des nuisances pour la sécurité publique et dans l'espace public. Ces personnes sont traitées comme telles par le public et les décideurs, et tous les ordres de gouvernement doivent ensemble planifier et entreprendre des actions concrètes pour garantir le respect du droit au logement des personnes vivant dans des campements. Le gouvernement fédéral en particulier a le devoir de faire preuve de leadership dans ce domaine et de veiller à ce que les municipalités aient les ressources nécessaires pour remplir leurs obligations en matière de droits de la personne. As I plan my future work to promote and protect the human rights of encampment residents, I will be guided by the research findings as well as the excellent work of The Shift and the Foundational National Protocol for Homeless Encampments in Canada written by Leilani Ferha and Caitlin Schwann. And I will be guided and inspired by what I learned from Indigenous residents and lived experts. In August, I visited Victoria, Prince George, and Vancouver and listened to some of the residents listening, uh, living in encampments that feature in the case studies we'll be hearing about today. And while in BC, I heard that many people choose to live outside because the alternatives are inadequate. And I was impressed by the depth of knowledge and capacity of the residents. This experience convinced me that a big part of my role is to help remove the systemic barriers which get in the way of people experiencing homelessness from helping themselves. And my office is working with the shift on a project to continue this direct engagement with encampment residents in four municipalities across the country. I started to share my concerns with a number of municipal leaders and intend to engage with the Big City Mayor's Caucus and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And my office will be organizing meetings with the federal level with Reaching Home and other relevant government departments such as CERNA and ISC to share these research findings and explore how the federal government can help ensure a human rights-based approach to encampments. Provincial and territorial governments also need to be part of the solution and I look forward for, uh, I really look forward to uh, finding opportunities to engage with them in this work. I'll also engage national Indigenous organizations and Indigenous-led housing organizations. The human rights of encampment residents will remain one of my top priorities, and I intend to mobilize my powers to review these gross violations of the right to adequate housing, which have persisted for far too long in communi communities across this country. By the end of the year, I expect to be in a position to deliver recommendations to the federal government and to advise provinces, territories, and municipalities about the actions required to fulfill their human rights obligation when it comes to encampment residents. And we can and we must do better to ensure that everyone enjoys the right to live in peace, security, and in dignity. And as you listen to the researchers today, I hope you'll be thinking about the role you can play to ensure a human rights-based approach to ending homelessness. I know, I know I will be. So thank you so much. Merci, miigwech. Thank you so much for your leadership and your engagement um, on many, many files, but particularly this file. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to move along um, to briefly just set a bit the context before we get into more of the results.
Um, we, ha we had a very quick turnaround on this project. Uh, the main research objective was really to provide the Office of the Federal Housing Advocate with relevant knowledge to examine the human rights dimensions on encampments across Canada. And in order to do so, we um, mobilized very quickly some research that was already taking place um, in the interest of time and in the interest of impact. Uh, but broadly speaking, there were four complementary objectives to produce a literature review on the human rights dimensions of encampments, a media scan of recent stories about encampments since the pandemic began, because we know that there has been an increase also in the, in the numbers of people experiencing homelessness since the pandemic, um, combined with the housing crisis. And uh, we wanted to produce also a few case studies to zoom in on local responses and expose the regulation of encampments and the violation of human rights. Uh, and lastly, um, a policy scan on laws uh, affecting encampments across Canada. So today, uh, we're going to provide in three separate 10-minute chunks uh, three provincial perspectives on the regulation of encampments. Um, and um, I'll, I'll hand it right over to Joe and Kim, uh, who are our first uh, presenters today. Thank you. Well, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on uh, where you are. It really is a privilege to be part of this uh, today, and uh, along with uh, Kim Hines in, in Victoria. Hi, Kim. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Joe? So I'm really keen to hear some of your thoughts uh, on what's going on. But first, let me just make a couple of brief comments about the two uh, British Columbia uh, case studies. Uh, the first one in, in Vancouver in Crab Park, one of the main takeaways from the Crab Park case study done by our colleague here, Alexandra Flynn, is that all levels of government have a role to play in ensuring human rights in encampments. And this includes the charter rights of encampment residents. Governments cannot simply act like uh, private property owners and legally or morally positioned unhoused people as trespassers or squatters, and then move uh, in an attempt to evict them or carry out prejudicial uh, policing uh, strategies. And this is particularly clear in Alex's case study. Uh, Crab Park, is, first and foremost, is on unceded Indigenous territory and, and is still owned under Canadian law, not by the city of Vancouver, but by the federal government itself. Um, turning to Prince George, I, I concluded in, in my study that the city has carried out gross violations of the principles embedded in human rights law primarily in terms of the unlawful destruction of resident shelters and belongings last November 17th, but also by the continued treatment of encampment residents and the use of the Safe Streets uh, bylaw. And, you know, it's important to note that last March, the city did actually apologize for the Moggason Flats demolition, specifically admitting fault in the harm that the city caused to vulnerable people uh, in their policing action. And, you know, as time goes on since then, I really regret to say this apology really seems to look like a cynical public relations move. The city of Prince George continues to have a colonial fort-like mentality on this issue and, I, and continues to, to show a, a strong level of contempt for unhoused people in public space, the majority of whom uh, are Indigenous. Uh, Prince George has a, a new mayor, Simon Yu, and he has suggested, I think he has, that he's open to something like a human rights approach. He has talked about the importance of inclusion and diversity and community compassion and response. And I think for him to have any credibility uh, on this issue going forward, he will need to immediately put a resolution forward to the Prince George Council to repeal uh, the Safe Streets bylaw. This would be, I think, the very minimum he could do to start a conversation with encampment residents in good faith and build a relationship with them, uh, something the city so far has had almost no interest in doing. So simply put, I think the city really has to move from this uh, crazy tunnel vision that seems to have captured uh, the city leadership 
uh, being that they can own, that they can somehow police their way out of this issue, despite all the evidence that this is the very worst approach uh, that they could take. So uh, Cam, just turning to Cam and maybe building on that a bit, uh, we had, we, we've talked a lot the last couple of years really uh, about what's going on in Victoria and Prince George and other places. And we, we talked about a story a couple of weeks ago uh, around a park in, uh, in Victoria. You want to talk about a bit of experience with my law there? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I just want to say I'm honored to be here and I'm uh, certainly in the Lekwungen Wasanic Territory, Lekwungen speaking Wasanic Territory Songhees. Um, and I'm a settler Acadian, uninvited guest in the territory and uh, really trying to stay grounded by keeping in mind the indigenous people who I know who, who, have, who are in my life and I'm, I'm thinking of them to help stay real. So what's happened is I, I went in one day to Stadacona Park, which is uh, an encampment trying to be an encampment and uh, a young man <clears throat> basically said uh, uh, that the bylaw came and every day they come I guess some days they don't it's a relief but most days they do and uh, they come and they make them move they displace them they have to pack up and they move six feet these are the people trying to be together for safety um, and they're constantly under attack of displacement, forced displacement. And he said, why do I have to move every day, six feet in the cold right now? What, like it, he said something like it makes him, his mental health, you know, struggle. And the bylaw officer actually said, because you are entrenched. So it, it just kind of struck me and I came home and I looked up entrenched and it, it's about war. So it's like the, the bylaw are seeing human people as a, a oppositional force that they have to go out and move. And it's just upsetting. I just found it very fascinating that they use that, uh, that terminology. Um, and, and there are a couple other parks too, just to, to remind people like Topaz where people are trying to be in encampments, but it's like uh, the police state apparatus are not allowing it. And, uh, uh, they, uh, you know, I, I must bring up that they have infiltrated outreach. Uh, it's very difficult for outreach workers. It's very difficult for BC housing workers. It's very difficult for all of them to do their jobs and for community to even go and be with them has been a bit of a battle. And uh, um, you, you spoke about this. I'm a peer. I'm lived experience. A lot of people are, and there's a lot of, um, um, indigenous community in, in our Leon community and so we are trying to give, give them the support pr predominantly right now because it's really clear that like there's a real issue around social stigma and social inequality you know what I mean and it's like it's affecting their lives every day and it affects our mental health of people who are housed like this isn't just affecting the unhoused it's the worst case scenario that's right out there um, and it's a bit I don't know how to explain, like the words sometimes are hard to find. It's disconcerting uh, how much uh, there's like a battle between social inequality and social stigma. Or do you know what I mean? Like there's a battle between social equality, social equality, and this thing with social stigma. And uh, I, I've been feeling, and maybe it's radical, I don't know, but I've been feeling like, and I've been witnessing that the police are leading, like the police state apparatus, that's bylaw, police, private security. And I want to say thank you to the private security who are not acting like police. Um, but uh, predominantly, they seem to lead in social stigma, and it really affects uh, the people who are in the encampments. And it's starting to affect the people who are trying to be in the community still. So uh, we now you know, have to go out in pairs uh, in concern about attacks, that kind of thing. So you're out there trying to help the unhoused who are displaced every day. And and one other point I want to make is consistently right now, the bylaw keeps saying to, to the unhoused, when they say, why, 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 they say, talk to BC Housing. Like, you know, why are, they, why are you coming here every 15 minutes driving here to our shelter? Talk to BC Housing. They contracted us for that. Uh, when you ask them about this, uh, uh, stuff right now I've noticed in the downtown east side when they do violence there the police are saying talk to the NDP leader uh, it's like they're they're doing all these things 
and they're they're saying that you got to talk to those people because they have the power but really i don't see that our elected officials have the power in the municipalities you know to sort of uh say you know to bylaw can you back off um or to police can you can you back off can we allow uh, the peer workers in please with all due respect like like it's like uh i, I anyways oh that's uh that's our timer there <laughs> we got one minute. We got one minute. <laughs> one of the other meetings that were trenched uh, that you, yeah, I think we're up to a minute. We have a minute left. But well, one of the almost second meetings that were trenched was goes along has to do with, uh, you know, moving six feet, moving 10 feet, you know, moving around yeah. the of site. So the second meeting is that there's uh, really the person has no place at all in public space. They're a non citizen there, they don't hold any sort of rights. And uh, no matter what they do, the, their existence through a network of, of bylaw fences often, their existence is actually outlawed in, in public space. So it seems to have that dual meaning of, yeah. of adversary and, and expulsion at the same time. Is that right, do you think? Well, yeah, and look at how many people ha are being, so they, they, you know, like people are having mental health breakdowns. I mean, I'm working with all the skills I have for mine. Most people I know, you know, we have a home, we have uh, the ability to do particular basic things to, to care, but our unhoused don't. It's affecting our mental health as well. Do you know what I mean? Um, and, and in that, I, I kind of lost my train of thought there, but uh, I think, yeah, can you ask a question again? But you know what I mean? It's like, we, we, the police are, yeah, the police are not the answer. They're not the solution. And how do we empower the municipal uh, how do we, I don't know, like it's, it's, I'm looking forward to hearing from other people here because the police are not just saying you have to move, they're shooting people. We've had uh, killings in the downtown east side on Hastings um, after that man was shot with the beanbag shotgun and died because he had, uh, you know, accidental pepper spray in his eye or whatever. And he was trying to get milk on his eyes and everybody went around and was telling the police he's okay and they shot him with the pepper bag, you know, the beanbag. He's dead. That's a travesty, man. And then the next day here in Victoria, uh, one of the brothers who uh, was removed from Staticona Park was up by uh, 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 Uptown Mall. And thank you to Louise Dixon, Times Colonist, for reporting this in a respectful way and putting our uh, alarms to it. But the police displaced him at 12.30 in the morning. And uh, very upsetting to hear about this. And, and he ended up running and they, they shot him with the pepper, the beanbag uh, shotguns. And he went to uh, jail for the weekend, and his dogs were taken a bylaw, and uh, or in the pound, and they still have his dogs. So that that's really distressing to people. So you know we need the support and money to go to counseling, support, peer support, being able to be in the public with our human fellow people. You know, yeah, we, we need support to get to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks so welcome. much, Kim. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Kim, for also uh, really giving an intimate view of the human consequences. You know, we're not just <laughs> talking about encampments as physical space. We're talking about the human consequences as well. And we don't have time right now to address this slide that you see before you that's going to rapidly disappear. But uh, just know that in our final report, there's a whole chapter, an excellent chapter, um, here by authored by Joe uh, on the impact of municipal bylaws and the regulation of encampments. But you you really detailed elements to it. But just to know that there's a there's a chapter and there's a framework there to to better understand uh, some of exactly the harassment, the moving along, the displacement, and everything that you mentioned. So I'm going to pass it on to Esther, who's with us, who has 10 minutes to talk to us about uh, from the Ontario case studies. Thank you, Esther. I hope you're there. Thanks so much. <clears throat> so Toronto um, and Hamilton are interesting case studies in terms of just illustrating the disconnect between the theory um, and narratives that governments um, uh, perpetuate about the right to housing and their practices and then what they actually do on the ground. The City of Toronto, for example, has expressly adopted an inclusive rights-based approach to housing in their Toronto Housing Charter and their Housing Action Plan. And they've done so expressly to be in compliance with international human rights law and the federal recognition of the right to adequate housing. 
It's also um, recognized its obligations under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. In fact, it was one of the first, the first governments in Canada to do so, specifically recognizing rights of self-determination in relation to social programs, including housing. At the same time, they have acted as if they're not bound by human rights commitments, that these are aspirational. The ongoing reality of encampments in Toronto and Hamilton during the pandemic has demonstrated that these obligations remain unfulfilled. And in fact, councils continue to reject concrete proposals and motions put forward to implement elements of a human rights based approach. So, for example, we've seen in both case studies, a, cons a consistent lack of support for basic service provision forced evictions across multiple sites uh, under heavy police presence with police violence at times, all based on the punitive enforcement of bylaws and trespass. Residents' belongings have been destroyed and treated as waste. There have not been consistent offers of permanent adequate housing at eviction sites. Indeed, some have been offered no housing at all or only inappropriate and unsafe shelter space from which many residents have returned to encampments. Bylaws continue to be enforced in both um, cities that are clearly inconsistent with the application of a rights-based approach that actively criminalize residents and supporters including in Toronto requests for egregious release conditions for those charged at evictions, including a ban of two residents from all city parks and community centers for one year. In Hamilton encampments, um, as in Toronto, were spread across many sites. And um, while there was an early um, successful uh, injunction motion that resulted in a negotiated settlement and an bylaw enforcement protocol. Even under the protocol, we saw violations, um, uh, though the amended process for bylaw enforcement under that did provide for some notice um, and did provide for some exceptions for those who were deemed uh, highly vulnerable under the agreed upon assessment tool. Nonetheless, we saw throughout um, 2020 and 2021, Hamilton um, uh, enforced restrictions on the size of encampments. We saw um, location restrictions enforced against encampments, continuing the cycle of forced displacement. And we heard advocates say that this made it very difficult to continue to um, sustain relationships and provide support for encampment residents. For the <clears throat> um, balance of 2020 and early 2021 in Hamilton, um, this was the uh, status quo, but in the summer of 2021, Hamilton Council repealed the protocol unilaterally with just three weeks notice and introduced a six step enforcement plan to reinstate their regular bylaw enforcement. In both Toronto and Hamilton, we saw encampment residents and allies strong uh, civil society networks that had been built up to support those living in encampments use legal strategies to attempt to enforce their human rights. And if we go to the next slide, the, the case names are on there. Um, the, in Toronto, we had a um, injunction um, application in Black and City in Toronto and in Hamilton. Later on, we had um, the Poff and Hamilton case. Both of these raised charter uh, grounds for um, protection of the uh, encampment residents' human rights. And um, both were unsuccessful in obtaining those injunctions. And we have not had a full hearing on the merits. So we, uh, the attempt to use legal strategies was um, thus far unsuccessful, despite uh, findings that there was uh, merit to the raising of Section 7, um, the security of the person arguments, as well as Section 15 equality arguments. So these decisions do not affirm that these bylaws are in fact constitutional, but they determine that uh, the court found on the balance of uh, convenience that the cities were 
um, able to continue to exercise their right to govern public space, even when there was a danger of these human rights violations. The um, courts in Ontario have taken a little bit of a different tack than the courts in BC, and we have really seen an emphasis in Ontario on cities um, pro property rights to govern that public space and a very uh, strong um, a very strong um, uh, inclination to accept cities arguments that the shelters provided are both accessible and adequate um, and that the cities have taken uh, the appropriate steps to uh, protect people during COVID. These, this balance of convenient tests, the convenience test has really privileged the evidence of the city and made it very difficult to, um, to uh, um, enforce the, um, the uh, rights-based framework because it's not an easy space in which to recognize um, encampment residents as rights holders to um, provide the context of encampments, including the impacts of colonialism, systemic discrimination in housing and policing, and has really failed to address the lack of meaningful consultation, basic services, and ongoing criminalization of encampment residents and allies. Thank you, Esther. Wow, you're under time. Good job. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be questions at the end. Alors, on poursuit avec Caroline. C'est à toi, son tour. Donc, euh, bonjour tout le monde. En fait, je tiens à souligner euh, que je suis sur les terres des Abenaki et que c'est un honneur de partager cet espace collectif pour mettre en commun euh, nos connaissances sur les campements. Pour ma part, je vais vous présenter un court compte-rendu, en fait, de la situation au Québec. Euh, parmi les villes qui ont attiré l'attention des médias, c'est Gatineau, Sherbrooke, Montréal. Et si on referait l'exercice aujourd'hui, on pourrait rajouter Grimby. Par contre, euh, ça ne veut pas dire qu'il n'y en a pas ailleurs au, au Québec. Donc, sous, euh, tu pourrais euh, bouger juste… Oui, parfait. Donc, on va aborder la réponse de la communauté. Plus principalement, il y a plusieurs personnes en situation d'itinérance, en fait, qui résident dans les campements, qui ne veulent pas avoir recours au refuge euh, pour différentes raisons. Par exemple, les règlements qui sont stricts, mais aussi le maintien de leur autonomie. Par, pour certaines d'entre elles, en fait, les refuges sont vus comme un, un contre une contre-production, en fait, à l'insertion sociale parce que ça les plonge dans un cercle vicieux. D'autres vont aussi revendiquer à travers les campements leur droit au logement et euh, certains d'entre elles vont euh, revendiquer ce droit de sorte à ce qu'il soit respecté sans contrainte, donc sans intervention. Donc, euh, les personnes en situation, ben, les personnes qui résident les campements croient qu'il est possible d'agir dans la prévention en mettant en place des solutions pour assurer la sécurité. Euh, dans ce que nous avons pu voir dans l'analyse, c'est que plusieurs personnes se sont mobilisées pour faire face aux enjeux de sécurité, pour garder leur lieu d'habitation, en ajoutant par exemple des inspecteurs à chacune des abris, ou voire même des bidons d'eau pour minimiser l'impact face aux incendies. Euh, on a aussi vu plus particulièrement à Sherbrooke une autogestion des dons via euh, la page Facebook pour cibler plus spécifiquement en fait euh, leurs besoins, mais aussi éviter les surplus là, des donations qui peuvent euh, vite dégénérer. Euh, pour ces personnes, en fait, les euh, démantèlements, c'est une perte de repère qui va venir augmenter les risques pour leur santé, leur vie, surtout en pleine crise euh, des surdoses. On l'a vu beaucoup dans l'analyse. Euh, on a aussi euh, compris que plusieurs personnes vont se mobiliser pour revendiquer et dénoncer les démantèlements, par exemple, en euh, manifestant. Euh, plus particulièrement lors euh, du campement euh, du démantèlement du Boisé Stanberg, il y en a beaucoup qui se sont mobilisés. De plus en plus, euh, les personnes en situation de silence vont revendiquer leurs droits, mais en étant visibles, euh, les campements peuvent donc être une forme de revendication, ce qui est confrontant pour les élus. Euh, au niveau des résidents aussi euh, qui cohabitent avec les campements, euh, ben en fait, ils ont un rôle assez important euh, dans la communauté. On a pu voir une vague de solidarité euh, très importante, mais aussi une revendication du droit d'occupation euh, en disant que les campements n'étaient pas nuisibles dans leur quartier sous forme de manifestations et aussi de pétitions. Mais à l'inverse, on a aussi euh, pu voir dans euh, l'analyse des médias 
que euh, certains résidents, résidents, en fait, protestaient la présence des campements par le biais d'une pétition. Donc, on peut changer, euh, Swan. Alors, euh, au niveau euh, de la réponse communautaire, il est difficile de passer à côté du collectif qui s'est euh, créé. C'est le collectif « On ne laisse personne derrière » qui est né d'une volo volonté collective pour soutenir les personnes qui n'avaient aucune autre option qu'une tente ou un campement euh, ou voir même la rue pour s'abriter. Il s'agit d'un regroupement euh, d'un grand nombre d'organisations euh, qui travaillent de près avec les personnes en situation d'itinérance et de grande pauvreté et euh, des regroupements aussi sectoriels. Donc, par conséquent, dans la réponse communautaire, selon la lecture de notre analyse dans ce rapport, euh, les ressources communautaires vont souligner que de déplacer les gens vers les, les refuges n'est pas la, la seule solution, euh, car euh, les refuges vont créer de l'exclusion et donc euh, ils sont d'accord à ce qu'il faut offrir différentes ressources et innover pour être le plus inclusif possible. Euh, pour le communautaire aussi, il faut euh, euh, renoncer au démantèlement dû au risque que cela engendre pour la santé et la vie des personnes en situation d'itinérance et que de démanteler devient inacceptable s'il n'y a pas de véritable alternative. Alors, euh, au niveau des campements versus le logement, bien, il faut re ils reconnaissent que les campements ne remplacent pas d'autres types de logements, mais que euh, les campements assurent une stabilité et que c'est une solution vers laquelle certaines personnes vont se tourner, qu'il faut respecter leur choix, mais aussi protéger leur autonomie. Il euh, faut souligner aussi, par rapport au collectif, des actions communautaires qui ont mis comme la campagne de dons, donc se sont mobilisés pour remettre des tentes et des sacs de couchage aux personnes. Euh, ça a été largement cri critiqué euh, médiatiquement là, par les, les décideurs. Et euh, de plus, ils ont aussi mis en place des dépliants informatifs sur la réduction des risques, qui est assez intéressant. Donc, euh, tous s'entendent pour réclamer une gestion des déchets dans les campements, euh, l'aide alimentaire, l'installation sanitaire pour assurer des conditions de euh, On peut changer, euh, s'il vous plaît. Donc, au niveau de la réponse politique, bien, on a pu remarquer dans l'analyse des articles médiatiques qu'il y avait une certaine distorsion entre la réalité du terrain et la, ré la réflexion des décideurs. Et on pouvait voir aussi une certaine instabilité dans leur position et leur décision face à la réponse au campement. Donc, tout d'abord, on pouvait, euh, la réduction et le manque de ressources, mais aussi le manque de financement des organismes communautaires ont été une source qui a mené à la création de certains campements. Toutefois, les décideurs euh, dans, euh, dans, dans les écrits ne reconnaissent pas toujours cette, cette, cet impact-là. Euh, nous avons aussi pu voir que la réponse des politiciens part avec une volonté de collaborer avec les personnes qui vont résider les campements, mais ça va se transformer euh, vers une approche punitive devant un euh, manque de solutions, mais aussi la détermination de voir les campements disparaître. Euh, nous avons aussi vu une certaine pression sur les résidents en campement en limitant leur capacité, comme par exemple en prenant leur bois pour euh, limiter... Euh, leur capacité de se réchauffer ou en demandant à la, à la population d'arrêter de fournir des dons afin de limiter leurs ressources et de les faire migrer vers euh, des organismes. En lien avec la santé publique, euh, il y a euh, en fait le, les raisons que les décideurs vont donner pour intervenir euh, face à un démantèlement, c'est souvent la nuisance, les enjeux de santé, de, de, de sécurité, de santé, euh, particulièrement l'hypothermie, euh, de célébrité, de criminalité, donc c'est tout ça qu'on recensait, mais aussi euh, des surdoses et quand les campements prenaient de l'ampleur avec du matériel permanent. Euh, on a aussi vu à Gatineau, par exemple, des enjeux pour l'environnement parce que le campement se situe, euh, se situe près d'un cours d'eau. Donc, toutefois, on a quand même pu comprendre que les enjeux liés à la sécurité pouvaient aussi être utilisés pour camoufler des enjeux politiques tels que la visibilité de l'itinérance, et ça, même si c'est une violation au droit de démon, euh, quand on démentait, c'est une violation au droit et que les risques de sécurité sont souvent plus grands euh, quand on démentait. Euh, parmi les stratégies qui ont été mises en place là, par les décideurs, euh, c'est l'opération mise à l'abri, qui est une action qui permettait de convaincre, hein, on, on, on nomme le, le mot convaincre, les résidents des campements à travers la ville de Montréal particulièrement, euh, pour qu'ils quittent de façon volontaire et d'aller vers les refuges en offrant d'entreposer leur effet personnel. On voit dans ce cas-là que c'est une stratégie qui, dé, qui déplace les personnes vers les refuges, mais 
qui ne sont pas nécessairement adaptés pour les accueillir et euh, qui bougent d'une place temporaire vers un autre lieu précaire. Alors, euh, au niveau de la tolérance versus le démantèlement, dans certains cas, les campements peuvent être tolérés. Mais même si les campements sont tolérés, les résidents restent quand même toujours dans une peur de se faire démanteler. Tolérer ne veut pas dire être accepté d'être quelque part, tandis que les démantèlements ben, peuvent avoir en fait engendré des coûts exorbitants au niveau économique, mais aussi la mobilisation des ressources communautaires peut être aussi un impact et euh, bien sûr l'impact psychologique que ça peut avoir tant dans la communauté en situation d'itinérance que le reste de la population. Alors, pour les décideurs, euh, ce qui est euh, intéressant euh, dans notre analyse, c'est que euh, leur perception des opérations est en lien avec les démantèlements et parfois distorsionnée du milieu communautaire. Euh, je prends l'exemple du campement Notre-Dame. En fait, euh, la, la, la femme aux communications de la ville de Montréal, Linda Boutin, précise que ça s'était déroulé dans le CAM. Et de l'autre côté, euh, la perception du communautaire amène l'idée qu'ils euh, ont vu des personnes qui étaient bouleversées d'avoir perdu leur maison, choquées de la violence de l'opération. Et à titre d'exemple, Michel Monette avait euh, nommé, en fait, c'était comme utiliser un bazooka pour tuer une mouche. Donc, ça peut nous indiquer à, à un peu le niveau de force qui avait été utilisé. Euh, on a aussi vu dans ce rapport qui a été possible de voir durant les élections municipales que différents candidats prenaient les campements comme un enjeu central pour montrer un peu leur couleur, particulièrement à Montréal. Et donc, euh, on a aussi vu euh, que les élus, les décideurs municipaux soulignent souvent que l'inaction des gouvernements provinciaux et fédéraux euh, en euh, ce qui concerne le logement est très, euh, très marquant et donc il, il signifie beaucoup aussi qu'ils n'ont pas de pouvoir sur la crise du logement, mais à l'inverse, le gouvernement dit qu'il y a assez de refuges et nie que les campements sont liés à la crise du logement, du moins à ce, à ce moment-là par rapport à l'analyse qu'on a euh, du euh, de la situation au Québec et euh, c'est la ministre déléguée au transport, Chantal Rouleau, qui avait mentionné que ce n'était pas directement lié à la crise du logement. Alors, dans, pour résumer, euh, c'est important de, 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 de bien euh, comprendre les enjeux au niveau des droits parce que ces gens-là ont des droits et je vous invite à prendre connaissance du long rapport là, qui a de multiples recommandations qui sont centrées sur les droits, mais aussi inspirées des recommandations du collectif « On ne laisse personne derrière ». Alors, merci. Merci, Caroline. C'est parfait. <rire> Caitlin Schwann, it's your turn. Is everything okay on your end, Caitlin? Oh, can you hear me? Okay, great. Yes, I'm here. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks very much, Suen. I'm here. Uh, hi, so honored to be here. My name is Caitlin Schwann. Um, I'm an uninvited settler calling in from the traditional um, territories of the Hopi, Yavapai, and Ap uh, Apache peoples here in, in Arizona, actually. Um, my colleagues today have, have really powerfully articulated what encampments force us to grapple with as a society. They really ask us to, to ask difficult human rights questions. And I think the most vivid one for us is, do we as a society believe people who don't have housing have a right to life? Because that is really what we're talking about today um, when we're talking about encampments. We're talking about people who are trying to survive in the most dire circumstances and trying to protect their lives. Um, so to add to this discussion, very briefly, I'm going to be talking about uh, the National Protocol on Homeless Encampments. Um, this was drafted by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing um, and myself in 2020. And the hope with this document is that it would outline um, legal obligations that governments in Canada have towards people living in encampments. Um, so we're drawing both on domestic law and international human rights law. So it was supposed to be a very um, a comprehensive statement on, on what those standards are. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Thank you. So there, there's eight principles that we outline. Um, I'd encourage you, just because we don't have much time, to go and look at the document. My colleague is going to post it in the Q&A, um, a link to this document. But uh, I'm going to go through three of these key principles um, that I think are, are particularly relevant for our conversation today. Next slide, please. The other thing I wanted to mention before I get started is that we also developed a two page document for folks living in encampments on what their human rights are. We worked with advocates and activists and folks living in encampments to develop this. So I'll ask my colleague to also put uh, a link to that in the chat and feel free to download it and distribute it, print it, photocopy it, um, share it with folks as a resource as well. So check out both the protocol and the two pager, please. Yeah, next slide, please. Thanks. So kind of diving into the principles here, um, kind of first and foremost, the protocol really realizes that residents of encampments are rights holders. They have a right to housing and a right to life, and governments have obligations to uphold their rights. And Marie Jose actually spoke to this very beautifully. What human rights law articulates is very nuanced. Encampments are human rights violations because people are forced to rely on them due to government failures, but they're also a human rights claim. They are made in response to violations of the right to housing by people who don't have housing otherwise and have been effectively severely marginalized from society. And they are an expression of people's attempts to claim legitimate space within cities, the right to build a community, to assert claims to land and territories, and, and a refusal ultimately to be made invisible. And in this way, they are kind of a grassroots form of human rights practice. And what this means for governments, the obligation this imposes on governments is that they can't respond to encampments from a place of governance from a focus on city beautification, from a focus on property prices, the response has to come from an understanding that encampments are legitimate homes that people have a right to, even if those homes are on public or private property that they don't own. This is the, the human rights standards in law. Next slide, please. What is also at the core of this idea of people as rights holders is this idea of meaningful engagement. And that is the idea that people living in homelessness have the right to be involved in the design and implementation of policies of programs and practices that affect them. So governments often talk about doing consultations, for example, with people living in encampments. But what is important to understand is that in human rights law, the standard is very high when it comes to meaningful engagement. There has to be actual power sharing between governments and people who are living in encampments. So what do I mean by that? What we're talking about is a government can't go into a meeting with encampment residents with a predetermined idea of what is gonna come out. Residents have to be able to say no to a proposal without being evicted, without being ticketed, without having their property destroyed. And governments also have to provide people living in encampments with materials that will help them engage in making decisions about policies, practices, programs. Um, so that can be access to transportation, information, time and space to consider what are actually the best options for them. And it's really challenging work. I do not dispute that by any means, but it is really at the heart of recognizing that people living in encampments are experts in their own lives and that gov it's government's obligation to engage with them in that way with an understanding of their agency, um, an understanding of their capacity to design solutions for themselves. And so you're probably looking at this slide and wondering what is this image? Very brief story. Um, I met a woman at an encampment in Toronto uh, and spoke with her at some length. And uh, as I was leaving, I asked her, um, you know, seeing this kind of spooled out measuring tape there, could you tell me about this, this measuring tape and, and what function it, it uh, plays for you or 
what the importance is. And she said, yeah, this is my security measure because I can hear when people step on the measuring tape, it makes a particular kind of crinkle and it alerts me to the fact that someone is around my uh, tent and I need to be alert to that uh, for my own safety. So this is an example of like incredible innovation in the midst of lack of resources. And so when we think about human rights and meaningful engagement, we need to be thinking about uh, opportunities to kind of build on the innovation and creativity and skills that are already uh, being exhibited by folks who are living in encampments. Next slide, please. The second principle, and I'll speak to this briefly because many of my colleagues have spoken to evictions here, but just to say very central to a human rights approach is a prohibition against forced eviction of encampments. So international human rights law doesn't permit governments to dis destroy people's homes, even if those homes are made of tarp, made of cardboard, made of wood, and even if they're established without legal authority. So the standard is that governments may not remove residents from encampments without meaningfully engaging with them and identifying alternative places to live that are acceptable to them. And if they are removed uh, and there isn't sufficient legal resources provided to encampment residents, this is considered a forced eviction and it's considered a gross human rights violation. And uh, perhaps I'll skip over a little bit here, but just to say, you know, governments often use language, um, they, they often use discretionary, discretionary bylaws around uh, fire, health, safety in order to justify evictions. But, but what we've been finding in our research, uh, as my colleagues have spoken to, this is often inconsistent with a harm reduction approach to health and safety. Uh, it often doesn't center lived experts' experiences and realities and encampments or engage them meaningfully in developing solutions together. Next slide, please. I, I also wanted to very briefly mention this. This is something that we did with the protocol and with Pivot Legal Society out in BC was develop um, a tool for folks who are living in encampments to actually rate their governments um, with respect to whether they are affirming their legal and human rights obligations or not. So it, it's kind of a report card and it plays on this idea that all of us are very fearful of, of getting negative report cards, but it also gives the power back to folks who are living in encampments to say, these are my human rights. Um, this is the grade that we are providing to you, uh, the government, uh, about to what extent you are respecting them or not. Um, so I'll, I'll also drop a link to this resource as well um, that might be useful to folks. Next slide, please. And the final human rights principle I wanted to highlight um, for us is that under human rights law, governments must provide access to basic services such as clean water, sanitation facilities, electricity, and heat within encampments. In most encampments across Canada, access to basic services is quite limited, um, unpredictable, in some cases entirely absent. And in many cases, we have cities pushing folks out from where they are living by intentionally depriving them of access to water and sanitation and preventing the delivery of humanitarian aid in some cases. So the images you see um, uh, here are actually a city in BC that shut off water to showers that the community had built for the encampment. Um, so it was, uh, what was quite powerful is encampments took a, took a page from the protocol and printed it out on their right to water and sanitation and printed it on these showers uh, that had uh, the water shut off. And as all of you will know, this stands in stark contrast to what public health officials would say about encampments, but it also violates a number of human rights, including the right to water and sanitation. So I'll stop there, but please look at those resources. I do hope that they are incredibly helpful. The research we've developed um, should also be helpful to, to all of you who are working in this area and um, sending much gratitude and solidarity to, to everyone who's working in this area. Thank you very much.
Thanks so much, Caitlin, for a really impactful <laughs> expose. Thank you very much. Alex, we're on to you. Yes, hi, everybody. I, I just want to say at the outset how, um, how grateful we are to have all of you here. Um, I'm speaking to you from the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, um, but I see that so many of you are coming from um, jurisdictions all across uh, all across the country, and um, it's uh, it's heartening to see that um, this is a crisis. This is a housing crisis that um, unhoused people are bearing the brunt of, um, and our research. Um, is essentially acknowledging the extent to which people have been harmed uh, through eviction processes that violate people's human rights, disregard notions of citizenship, um, and deny access to public space for the most vulnerable people um, who are experiencing this housing crisis. And, you know, as you saw, as you heard from my colleagues, um, these practices do not lead to safer conditions for unhoused people. Um, they are simply placed in increasingly insecure and unsafe situations. Um, we have, you know, municipalities all across the country who are um, engaged in evictions with some uh, people within municipal spheres trying to promote different approaches. But in our view, um, this should not be a municipal by municipal situation. There needs to be leadership and this leadership needs to come from the federal government. Um, and it needs to come from the federal government because they have, in, they have enacted a piece of legislation that recognizes the human rights of, uh, of people to have housing. Um, and this includes people who live in encampments because they do not have any other safe, suitable locations to live. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up our, um, our presentation with the recommendations that we provide to the Government of Canada. I mean, you've heard a lot about the enforcement of encampments at the local level. And You've also heard how there's a, a federal act that recognizes the right to housing. And so what we are trying to do is stitch together these two issues. How can we ensure that um, this national right is seen all the way down to the municipal sphere? And so we have five recommendations for the government of Canada specifically. And this is premised on the view that the, the government of Canada cannot take a back seat to what is going on in encampments. Um, we are very happy that the federal advocate recognizes this. And in our view, the government of Canada must recognize this in concrete, um, clear ways that show that it is committed to the human rights of people who are encampments. So number one, a rights-based approach to encampments requires all governments to end their practices of using trespass orders, bylaws, and policing to evict unhoused people from encampments. So this is a recognition that encampments are survival spaces for unsheltered people, and that they are highly policed and regulated through a number of actors, jurisdictions, and authorities. And these authorities are asserting um, rights to municipal space as though it's private space through trespass orders. In our view, governments must recognize the rights to safety, security, and human dignity by responding to encampments without relying on policing and punitive or exclusionary measures. And we advance that these rights are enshrined in the National Housing Strategy Act, which incorporate international norms of human rights that Caitlin has already spoken about. So in addition to, and we'll offer some suggestions on how to ensure that municipalities abide by these human rights standards, we call on the Government of Canada to practice what it preaches in terms of the legislation where there are encampments on federal lands. So specifically, Crab Park in Vancouver is located on federal lands, and this is a perfect location for the federal government to acknowledge the human rights that it has enshrined in its own legislation 
by not uh, fighting against um, unhoused people and by recognizing their human rights in all aspects. Number two, we call on the federal government to provide funding and services to offset the impact that's felt by municipalities in addressing the housing, housing crisis and the, existing, the existence of encampments. Um, in our view, there are short-term options such as investments in modular housing and much needed longer-term investments in social and affordable housing. And this is urgent and necessary and needs to be accelerated in order for um, people who are living in encampments to have suitable housing that they can go to. Um, in addition, we call on the adaptation of existing Government of Canada um, programs such as Reaching Home and the Rapid Housing Initiative um, to provide these options. And we also call on the federal government to require all recipients of federal funds to adopt a rights-based framework in the enactment and enforcement of bylaws, policies, and other frameworks as already exist, is, exists uh, in other spheres, such as the receipt of healthcare funding. Number three, um, the participation of people living in, in, uh, in encampments is needed to properly design and implement policies, programs, and practices that affect them. Um, Caitlin has already spoken about is this in detail, but the takeaway here is that there is knowledge that unhoused people have, and that knowledge must find its way into the uh, programs and policies that are determined. Number four, there must be a recognition of the distinct rights of Indigenous peoples. So in our view, encampments in Canada are linked to the historic and ongoing colonial practices that harm Indigenous peoples and that contribute to housing inequities. And this includes broken treaty promises, dispossession of land, residential school, and chronic underfunding of housing and social services for Indigenous communities. And we see that there are higher rates of homelessness amongst Indigenous peoples across Canada. This is appalling and is contrary to the adoption of UNDRIP that at least in the BC context, all three governments have enacted and that the federal government has enacted too. So the approach to encampments that um, is being taken fails to honor these obligations and to address the rights of Indigenous encampment residents. And the government of Canada must address this. Uh, it is also bound by the constitution and by other obligations to ensure that um, Indigenous peoples are engaged, that their laws are engaged um, when uh, contemplating um, uh, how to address uh, human rights. Number five, and finally, and then hopefully there'll be time for plenty of questions, um, a rights-based approach requires access to basic services such as clean water, sanitation facilities, electricity, and heat. So while people are living in encampments, they must have their basic needs met. They must have services that are going to recognize their health and safety concerns. And these uh, health and safety concerns should not be dismantled by government actors, um, uh, you know, which is happening again all across the country. Um, and so in our view, the Canadian government must number one, acknowledge that these services are needed for people in encampments. And number two, must enable these services to exist in order to recognize the human rights and dignity of people who are unhoused. Um, so I'm going to end there and I'll pass it back to Sue Ann. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alex. I'm going to stop the share screen now so we can see a few more faces. Um, and I'm going to invite <laughs> Co-researchers here, panelists, if there, there's a couple questions in uh, the question answer, QA. Um, so I'm going to ask you to maybe, we have about 15 minutes, uh, we could answer, try and take on two or three questions, but I kind of want to ask you all if there's a, some questions that you want to speak to, that you want to try to answer, or any other thoughts that you might have from your presentations that you didn't have time maybe in because you know everybody only had 10 minutes which wasn't a lot of time so if there's anything you want to kind of add 
or in conjunction with maybe a question here. Any, do I have any takers here? <laughs> we can go one by one, but uh, I see seven questions. Can I propose something, Sue Ann? Yes. Actually. I'm wondering if perhaps Alex and Esther, I see a number of questions that are asking um, essentially like how do we hold municipalities accountable for their human rights obligations um, in light of you know any number of bylaws or, or kind of practices and policies and I, I'm not a lawyer but I know you folks are kind of steeped in this and I'm wondering if you might be willing to speak to it or Joe it'd be great to hear your thoughts on this Kim I know you've been doing activism in this area I'm happy to take a first, I'm just looking, sorry, for the delay, I was just looking at the questions now. Um, so, um, you know, a big part of Esther and my research focuses on how local governments are looking at um, the pub, at public space. Are they looking at it through the lens of private owners, or are they looking at space through the lens of a government that represents all uh, citizens who live in the city, in, including unhoused people. Um, and in our view, that shifts the way in which municipalities are going to um, enforce bylaws, um, the way that they're going to, if, if they have power over policing, the way that they're going to direct police. Um, and so, you know, adopting a lens that uh, municipalities have human rights obligations because they are governments and because they represent unhoused people too, is one uh, direct way that uh, things will change in our view, that it will shift which bylaws are enforced. Um, cities can decide not to enforce a bylaw if they, uh, if they feel that it isn't appropriate. Um, and so they can make that decision um, and they do make that decision. Uh, how many of us jaywalk, for example? Um, and, and don't get caught. So even though it's contrary in most municipal bylaws. So there are, there are mechanisms that municipalities can adopt if they also understand themselves as human rights actors. Um, Esther, I don't know if you have a, anything to respond to that. Yeah, I mean, that captured a lot of what we've been working on beautifully. I think, you know, what, part of what's really challenging is that um, there isn't a lot of of legal infrastructure for the enforcement of human rights at the local level. And so that's something that I think the federal government and the advocate can really help us think about building out. So it, it is a fact that these obligations from other levels of government and international law do bind municipal governments, but what we need is more commitment and infrastructure and tools to really make it feasible to do that kind of enforcement. Um, it's not enough to rely on fundraising and the willingness of people in incredibly vulnerable positions to bring uh, actions in our courts. We actually need other levels of government to take responsibility for ensuring that human rights obligations are um, being fulfilled by all actors. And the federal government has a particular obligation. They do not have the luxury of saying, you know, oh, well, that's a different level of government. They, they in international law, have those obligations to, to ensure that other levels of government do their jobs in accordance with what they've committed to. Yeah, just to uh, just to add to, to Alex's point, I mean, municipal governments and bylaw services have the choice not to do things, uh, not to enforce particular sections of, of bylaws, not to have particular enforcement programs, and that's just that's that's really important. There's there tends to be a knee jerk reaction, particularly in BC, because of uh, uh, housing being provincial responsibility. That the only tools that municipalities have are through bylaws, and they have to use them. Uh, in, in some sort of way to be seen active on an issue. And I think, you know, there has to be a, a way of, of, of talking about these issues with municipal leaders and with mayors and saying it's important not, not what you're doing, but what you, you consciously decide not to do for human rights reasons. The, the second point, I'm just addressing one of, the, one of the earlier questions in there. It has to do with uh, a bottom-up or, 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 or top-down approach you know, the, the greatest resource that municipalities have on this issue are 
encampment residents themselves, not municipal bylaws, not uh, policing strategies. Uh, it, and that requires a sincere and sometimes courageous commitment by municipal leaders to build relationships uh, with encampment residents and street involved uh, people. And, you know, I think it's, it's given the stigma and the historic views we have around unhoused people, I think municipal leaders really have to be, uh, you know, really have to be pressured into the position that that's the, uh, that that's the, that's the correct thing to do. It's a legitimate response. It's, it's for the public good. And this is the best way of this, that, that the issue locally is going to be solved uh, over a period of time. Kim, did, did you want to add anything before we move on to another question? No, it's, it's okay. <laughs> I, I, I really I really appreciate Joe jumping in. I, I feel like a lot of the questions that people uh, brought up from the downtown east side, I feel like we need help from legal people to answer that, if you know what I mean. Yeah, exactly. And actually, on that note, I see a few questions in the chat around the federal housing advocate's role. Marie-Jose, I think you're still with us. I don't know if you wanted to maybe take some of those. Uh, specifically, there was a question from people on the downtown east side and uh, the federal housing advocate's role. Um, you know, how does it work? How can people reach out to you? I'm gonna read it exactly. What is the best way to engage the federal housing advocate and to make use of this research in responding to evictions which are taking place right now? in Hastings Tent City, in the downtown east side of Vancouver. So I don't know if a question for you would be good if you're there. I am here. Um, wow. Well, I wasn't sure about answering questions today, but I, I can say, you know, our, our direct engagement tool is is really through, through our submission tool, um, but it's not going to be immediate action. And, uh, you know, and, and that's kind of, that's really the unfortunate part of all of this is, is we can't intervene right away. We've done things like we wrote letters to, you know, mayors. Uh, we are in contact with mayors um, through certain means. We, we want to do it through official, you know, large channels. But on the other hand, you know, I, it's, um, I don't have the power to kind of intervene on an individual basis. But we do need to hear from you and and what you do submit to us, you know, it is an incredible voice and it adds to the weight, but we can't, it won't have the immediate results. And that's, that's the part that keeps me up at night, I have to say. So. And I apologize if I put you on the spot to <laughs> look at okay. that one. But I think <laughs> Thank you. Sees, sees every opportunity to, for the, for the research that we've done in the context of this project to have impact too, and to know how people can, can use it, can mobilize it. Um, are there other questions that you panelists would like to attempt to answer? There's been some questions about um, municipal bylaws, it keeps coming back and how to deal with that. Um, there's also a question more specifically about um, Indigenous people and um, are, are any efforts being made to work with First Nations, Métis and Inuit governments or at least be informed of their interests, research and infrastructure that they are developing of their own accord and ensure they are part of the research, policy making and meaningful participants. Um, so there's, there's a lot of really, um, yeah, different kinds of questions, different levels too of, of impact and I'm not sure if panelists you'd like to, I see Kim has his hand up, would like to try to answer. Yes, Kim, over to you. I, I'm just gonna try and uh, uh, touch on and maybe inspire others to, to follow or add to. It seems like the, the answer to this police state that does not often listen to the, the municipal or like as in Vancouver, they're in a pretty harsh situation where the, the people who just got voted in are, are, are supporting this police state. It seems like historically the only solution has been that community organize so that we have to use this information that you all worked on to organize and mobilize and go out on like in groups. We, it just seems it's the only solution and maybe others can speak to that like you know like like because it's that's what we're dealing with is it's like a war and people's lives are just trying to be lived 
and people are trying to bring dignity to it. And there they are, the police and the bylaw, you've seen the video, so it's, it's very intense. Yeah, I agree with you. I, it's, I mean, the, that's it in the chat. There's the different levels. There's the oppression people are experiencing directly. Uh, how to also, how does human rights law, how can it take precedence over municipal bylaws that are actually being used and kind of also the soft power around, um, you know, the stigma associated with also uh, living without, um, living in an unhoused situation. So I'm really not sure how to take on a last question if somebody has a last question they want to try to answer because it did so many different levels of of action and emotion in the chat um i'm happy to offer some thoughts um so you know it is dire and it's it's a terrible situation for people who are living in in encampments uh for precariously housed people generally and for advocates it's it's really tough and some jurisdictions are worse than others right like we see i of course come at this from the legal lens and we see that in ontario for example courts have not been uh an easy route to make inroads on the conditions that people face um however i just want to offer a more hopeful lens which is that we have the national housing strategy act it has rights that are enshrined in it the housing advocate role has been created there are ways, and we have examples of this, there are ways to bind provincial and municipal governments who receive federal funding, and that should be done. There are ways to increase funding um, and tie those to human rights goals that must be done. There are ways to lobby against inhumane practices at the local level. So many of you out here are doing it right now, and we must continue. We must all continue to do this work because good things do occur, you know, uh, positive steps can be made. The court cases in Prince George, for example, the judicial review that was brought in Crab Park, there are still more legal arguments to be made, there are still more strategies to be adopted. So don't give up. Um, we have to keep going. Yeah, and on that note, you know, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Alex, for for coming up with a whole whole kind of conclusion. I think you know these aren't just legal battles as well, right? They're also you know how we share space in society. Even um, I think of really the the social stigma elements too, being also a non legal scholar. Um, those ties. I mean, when people in encampments say that they feel more of a sense of community and solidarity in those spaces, I think we as a society have to question what kind of models of housing and offers and supports and services are we offering that people don't feel included in what's being proposed right and that it's not corresponding to people's needs and their ways of wanting to live and be together so i think i think as much as i feel like you said hopeful about some of the recent um legal decisions and everything it's like we can't leave it all on that either it's like it's really a collective responsibility about uh, changing how we respond and like kim mentioning the police repression and not accepting that is okay you know even as somebody coming to this who is housed who lives well like not accepting that that's okay that that happens in my community i think that that's you know anyway i really really appreciate that i see a bunch of hands up all of a sudden i see kim caitlin esther so we'll try and finish in the next two or three minutes is that okay yeah kim took his hand down okay caitlin esther yeah, just to briefly say, um, Charlotte, your question is so incredibly important with respect to to what extent work in this area is working in parallel to or in collaboration with Indigenous governments who are looking at the distinct intersections of rights of Indigenous peoples and the rights of folks who are unhoused and living in encampments. Um, I don't have a lot to say other than to say this is incredibly important, and I just want to bring it to the whole group, the need for bridging conversations um, and bridging advocacy and work in this area uh, is just a, an area I think we tremendously need to focus on now and be really following Indigenous leadership in terms of um, how we're thinking about and responding to encampments and understanding the ways in which a vast majority of encampments are on stolen Indigenous land. 
Um, and uh, I, I think my my other colleagues will have other comments on this, but just to say that's incredibly important. And I also wanted to mention, I know there was someone in the chat who also asked about best practices and policies. This is something that the shift is working on that the Women's National Housing and Homelessness Network is currently working on as well. Um, so we can follow up uh, in the weeks to come on kind of what is ongoing, but there is a bunch of work ongoing in this area, but it is a fairly new area in the Canadian context. Um, so j just also to say, stay tuned for that. Thanks so much. Just very briefly reiterating what Caitlin said about the importance of um, looking at what Indigenous governments are doing, looking at treaty obligations, and this is something that Alex and I are really trying to foreground in the next stages of our work, and specifically in terms of some of the legal structures, but, you know, really interested in thinking about collaboration, about the policy and governance aspects. But what I also put my hand up to say is really in terms of changing the way we think about public space and the way that municipalities treat it. I think, you know, legal legal approaches are important, but enacting it in real life is what is going to change that. And there's so many incredible groups on the ground who have been doing this. And it's been really powerful. And so continuing to do that, and to live and treat live in and treat public space as a public common resource and a place where everyone belongs is the way we're going to change that. Thank you, Esther. Kim, last word, and also to tell people that the links have been put in the chat if you want to look up uh, the research reports. Um, there'll be more things coming out as well, but for today, we put in some links there for you to be able to access. Yeah. Kim, you get the last word. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, well, it's a positive, although some might feel kind of harsh, but people have uh, spoken about right to sleep actions right to sleep actions. One of the biggest cause of mental health breakdowns, one of the top three is a lack of sleep. And the police state apparatus are moving people around and keeping them awake and kind of feeding into that. It's, it's quite horrible, actually. Um, so, you know, having right to sleep actions with, uh, you don't need any more than 10 people who are willing to risk arrest. It seems that that's, and so people, with, there's, a, there's a team right now in our community of young academics waiting for the call, but we're really, really struggling. Uh, we need a tent, we need this, so, but it's happening. People are willing to do that. And I want people to know that uh, because it's hopeful. And so it's hopeful to get together with your community and in you know, uh, direct action, nonviolent civil disobedience, Martin Luther King, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have, a, there's, a, there's a history there, so I, I encourage people um, and it feels like you all will help and we need the support. Thank you so much. Thanks for the wonderful strategy and uh, thanks everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon or rest of your morning and the recording will be available on the Camus website soon ish. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you colleagues, panelists. Bye.